Welcome everyone to Studio Vasquez McKay. My name is Mark, uh, Mark Vasquez McKay, and today I would like to do a tutorial with you and share a few different possibilities of materials that you could potentially use for drawing. Now myself, I'm both a painter and a drawer, and I use uh, pretty much every material under the sky. So um, with my expansive exposure to different tools, I thought I'll share them here. So um, if you did want to skim forward in this video, because it is going to be a little bit long, I'm going to start with dry media. So under that, I'm going to cover graphite, charcoal, Conte, and pastel. Um, and then I'm going to touch on a few different wet media, including ink and watercolor. I know watercolor is normally a painting material, but I tend to include it quite a bit in my drawing. Uh, and laced into that, I'm going to show a few different examples of applications where I've used these materials. Uh, so you have a little bit of sense, not necessarily as a right or wrong way to do it, uh, but again, a little bit of inspiration. All right, so here you have my drawing cart. My drawing cart, you can't really see it right now, but it is on wheels. So whenever I'm working in the studio, I'm able to move it around with any given project that I'm working on. And I also like to have all of my materials sort of readily available because sometimes I might intend to be working on a charcoal drawing, um, but I decide to introduce an, another material. So I like to have everything sort of in one spot. So with that, um, I have my pens here, my drafting pens. I have my charcoal in this container. So synthetic compressed charcoal, some wash, some pencils, some Conte, some pastel, some graphite, some erasers, etc. All mixed into one. Um, additionally, I have drawers down here that carry a really nice surplus of any other material that I potentially need. So I have some paper set up for us here so that I can go through step by step with each material that we've sort of touched on and give you a little bit of a sense of how they operate. Um, so the first one is graphite. Graphite most commonly we know as a pencil, right? Because we went through school and we used these devices, these pencils, um, and they were probably an HB uh, because that's sort of in the middle of the line. And all my pencils here, you can see that I've marked them out based on their density because each graphite has a density to it. Uh, so on the lighter end of the spectrum, you have all your H's and then you have your B's. The way that I remember that is I think H is hard. So when something's hard, it's not going to be too heavy, right? So if I draw with a 2H pencil, it's going to be pretty light. Comparatively, a 9B is going to be a lot darker, right? So we have the comparative right there. Um, and so I think of H as hard, and I think B is bold, because it gives me a really heavy line. Personally, I find a 3B to be the best medium. So that one, I find I can get the most versatility, versatility out of. I can both do a light line, right? So when I'm sort of mapping something out, and I can also go with the heavy line, and I can get a nice gradation of values within that. And you'll also note that I'm quite particular about how I sharpen my pencils. So the ones that I use a whole lot, I sharpen with the Ulfa knife uh, because I like to be able to work it both on its tip and its side and I get a lot of versatility out of that. They also make some pencils that have a really heavy graphite, right? So comparatively, you can see this one has less wood and more graphite so that I can lay this one on its side and I can really work that. Um, working it on its side, I don't know if you can tell, but I sort of I have that nice smooth area right there. And the way that I achieve that is on my drawing board here, I have a piece of sandpaper. Um, some artists also have, they wrap sandpaper around um, those sticks that you buy or that you get when you buy uh, household paint you can do something like that or I know that they sell sticks that um, that you can use that already have the sandpaper on them uh, but I like to keep it right here and I have another one right here so as I'm drawing I can sort of sharpen as I go so those are 
the pencil form graphite. Now with graphite, you also can purchase them in these big sticks. And as with the pencil form, you'll see that there's 4B, right? So you have different densities of graphite. You can also get them circular. You can get them sort of square. So if you look to your art supply store, you can get a variety of different ones. Um, where would this be useful? This would be useful if you're doing big areas, right? You can sort of slowly work it and you can see I'm picking up the texture of the paper. Each paper is going to have a different texture. Um, work it like that and then you can use the pencil to get more specific. I'm going to get into that further when we talk about content about charcoal because it's the same idea with every drawing tool. I always try to have something that will cover mass and something that will cover line, right? Mass is big shapes on the side, line is tip. And again, with my pencils, some of them, I can do both. So there you have your graphite. Next, charcoal. Charcoal, I would say is my favorite, or at least my preferred medium to work with. You have a whole range of different charcoals and charcoal quite simply is, is burnt wood, right? It's, it's wood that's been um, heated up in a kiln so it's deprived of oxygen and you get sort of a burnt version of that. So here is a box of just really simple charcoal. You can get really nice charcoal, you know, that Windsor Newton cells and such. Um, this one is, a, I believe it's a willow charcoal. Um, yeah, pure willow charcoal. Um, willow and vine charcoal are pretty much interchangeable. And you can see if you look at this, you can actually see the little knots, right? Because this was an actual twig on a tree or yeah, a willow branch. And that's why it has the little curve in it. Um, so the difference between this and the other charcoal that we're going to explore is that this goes on really light. They're also very delicate. So they're easy to break and sort of size down, work on the side, work on the tip, etc. Um, <clears throat> So that's your willow charcoal. And again, willow and vine charcoal I find are pretty interchangeable and you can switch them up. The other charcoal that you're gonna work with, I give a little bit of a preview here. Um, it, it goes by a few different names. It can be compressed charcoal, which just means it's something like this, but it's densified or synthetic charcoal. Uh, the synthetic is closer to a pastel. And I prefer the synthetic over the, the compressed. And that's what I have here. But I also take this product and with my Olfa knife, I shave it down and I create a powder. So I have a big container here of this in powder form. Now, if you go to your art supply store, you can get powdered charcoal. But what I found is it's sort of light. It's, it's, it's a little bit gray. And I like this one that I make because it's a lot deeper. Uh, but also when I draw, it's going to match this a lot better. Um, so when you're doing your charcoal drawing, you want to start off with your willow or vine charcoal because your willow or vine charcoal is really easy to erase. And you can simply erase it with your fingers, right? Um, as you're going, if that shape was wrong, you just sort of move it over, etc. cetera. Um, and towards the end, if you did have any of those, you know, your white eraser omits it almost 100%. Um, so willow vine, start your drawing, map it out, etc. And then you want to move into your compressed. Reason being that compressed, unlike willow or vine, it doesn't really erase too easily. It sort of, it grabs on and it's quite dense. So you want to make sure that you're confident with your form before you move into the actual compressed charcoal. Um, so it's a commitment, but the nice thing about it is you know, you can move it around and you can get these really great gradations of value with it. And you can see it has almost a velvety type feel to it. So that's your um, compressed and your willow in stick form. And now the other thing that I said I like to do is I like to turn it into a powder. And with powder, once it's powdered, you can use various makeup applicators, anything that's designed for applying, you know, eyeshadow or any uh, powder form makeup, 
and you can get really soft areas with those. Or you can use these ones and get in some more detail type areas. And this will keep you from going too heavy, right? Because this line, it's, it's pretty committed. So you might want to go with your powder charcoal and just sort of slowly build it up before you get into any line. And again, these are great because you can work with different shapes. Um, this one, I can take my scissors and I can cut it down. I can work it on its side, on its tip. Um, anyway, sort of works. And you can see, I can also get some really nice gestures. So when I'm figure drawing, I like to use this because I can sort of bulk everything in. And then I can work either with my eraser to sort of shape it out a little bit. Or I can use, well, let's use this, sort of get my edges back in there and work it this way. So um, for myself, I have a tendency to use my fingers a whole lot, right? I get in there, I get pretty dirty. I like to be sort of tactile with it. But there's other people who prefer to use um, different tools. So these are, these are blending stumps. And you can buy them. You can see I'd like to shave mine down because um, I do periodically use them. Uh, but you can also run them through a pencil sharpener and you can get the tip back. Um, these are nice for sort of moving any material around. Um, these can be used with charcoal. They can be used with Conte, with graphite, whatever dry medium you're working with, with pastels. Um, and they're a great tool to have in the studio. Uh, and you can get them in different sizes. If you don't want to go out and buy a piece of tightly wrapped paper, you can just use paper towels, sort of like you know, twine it a little bit, and it's going to work great to move the charcoal around. Um, so those are two different types of charcoal. And then finally, you can get charcoal in a pencil format. And as with normal pencils, you'll see that they have different densities. Some of them use the same system of numbers and letters as what the pencils do. Other ones might just say um, soft, medium, or hard. Right, so you sort of just get a sense of the spectrum. These are always nice to work in tandem with the other ones because you can sort of, once you get to the point of detail, you can start to work the charcoal in a little bit and get more precision out of it. Um, so when you're drawing, I know this isn't a drawing lesson, um, but when you're working with pretty much anything, like if you're sculpting with clay, drawing, painting, anything, you want to keep in mind, you always want to work general to specific, right? You don't want to get into detail too quickly. So tools like this are really great for that. If you're more heavy handed, you can put this on its side, right? You can sort of bulk things out. Use your eraser to chisel it. Um, your white eraser is really imperative because it, in essence, is sort of drawing with the white, right? You're able to get that white back. This one's sort of you know, soft around the edges, but I always keep my erasers cut sharp so that I can, if I need an edge or if I need a really fine line, I can use the eraser and sort of work in reverse and get something like that. So that is charcoal. Um, and our next dry medium that I want to share with you is Conte. Conte is very similar to charcoal. Um, however, Conte comes from a specific factory that at one time was in Paris. I'm sure they've expanded beyond that. Um, but it has the embossment where it says Conte Paris. So it's a product rather than a material. Um, the difference between this and charcoal is that this has some wax in it. The wax does two things. One, it, um, it makes it glide a little bit smoother the other thing is it makes it harder to erase. And you can get a range, you can get soft, you can get medium, you can get hard, uh, but most people just use the general medium. Um, and a lot of people like the sepia colors, the different browns and such, because it uh, emulates more sort of traditional colors and such that were used. And of course the old masters would have been using this. I think this company has been around for hundreds of years. So um, yeah, what I like about it is it's very pressure sensitive. So I can take one of these sticks and I can sort of 
let me grab one with a sharper piece. I can put pressure on one end and let it feather out. So if I'm figure drawing, you know, I can do something like that where I have a hard edge and then I have a soft edge. So I can get a little bit of a range out of it. All right, I'll build that up a little bit just so it's easier to see. All right, so you can see I was, I was able to fan that out. Um, and then again, keeping with our general and our specific, right, our mass versus line, Conte, Conte also makes a pencil form Conte. And again, you can get this in black, you can get it in any color um, that they produce with the stick. And this is a great coupling because, again, you can go in there and you can get those details or you can sort of sharpen this. You can get this tip as sharp as you like to work it. So I have a tendency to sort of go back and forth between the stick and the pencil tool in, a, in order to be able to get uh, the best range possible. <clears throat> and Conte also makes a white. So if you're working on toned paper, it's a really great option. On that note, uh, we should take a look at the different options that we have with toned paper. And I know this isn't so much about paper, uh, but paper is pretty imperative. So I brought with me a few different options. Your two major producers of drawing paper are going to be Canson and Fabriano, uh, French and Italian papers. Um, within sort of dry media, those are the top ones. And they're all textured. And when you go to the art supply store, generally they'll specify what the intended medium is for them. So some of them are, are probably, you know, like this one intended for dry medium. So they'll say, you know, pastel charcoal conte. Um, so try to pick the one that's best suited for your application because if I were to go into this with ink, for example, it's going to wrinkle and it might get a little bit messy. Um, so you can get different sort of textures. We refer to that as the tooth, right? So you can have a very heavy tooth, which will be very textural, or you can have a lighter tooth, not so much, um, and they apply differently. But you are going to notice that when you spend money on drawing paper, the materials are a lot easier to work with. So I have students who, you know, are working with charcoal on cheaper paper and they're saying, you know, I can't erase it. It's really difficult. I'm struggling. Um, but you go up and you spend five dollars on a piece of paper. That's going to get a lot easier. But a little word of caution when you spend five dollars on a sheet of paper, you're also going to be a little bit timid. And you're not going to want to be experimentational and you're not going to want to make mistakes so i always like try to try to find a paper that you're comfortable with where um, you're not going to be too intimidated or feel the pressure of making a good drawing uh, but at the same time you're going to give yourself a good possibility so we can see with the toned paper i'm able to get a nice range of dark and light uh, i'm going to come in with my black Right. And as with charcoal, I can, of course, use my smudging tools and I can sort of move these around. I shouldn't double dip like this. I have a little bit of black on there, um, but you get the idea. Within the uh, different colors, right? So there's a nice range here. Everything's going to apply differently to different colors. I find I like the gray the best. Um, gray, you know, for me is a really nice neutral. And I like sort of starting in the middle and then branching out rather than starting with white and working towards a dark. If I'm with gray, it's really easy to branch out. Not only that, but you don't feel like you have to cover the entire thing. Whereas with white paper, you feel like every area has to be resolved or considered. With the gray, if a little bit of it's humming through, that's okay. That's just sort of a neutral ground for it. Um, so with that, I'll move forward to our final material that I want to share with you under the dry medium. Um, so these are my soft pastels. These are Rembrandts. Rembrandts um, are on the higher end of the spectrum. But I want to use a word of caution with these because they use real pigments. So for example, um, my red or some of my blues, etc. They're going to have toxic pigment in them. So when I'm working with them, I want to be really careful that those sort of powders don't go airborne and I blow on it and they end up in my lungs because it can be very harmful to me. So a lot of artists who work with these higher end pastels, they're going to use a face mask or something uh, to protect themselves from it. 
The alternative is quite simply use cheap pastels. Um, there are super cheap pastels, which you're going to really regret buying, but there's some good mid-range ones. So um, the best ones that I know of are New Pastel, and it's, it's N-U Pastel. Uh, and my friend Zachary Logan, who's a Saskatchewan-based artist, he shared that with me. Um, and that's what he works with. Uh, and of course, yeah, he's, he's got some amazing, amazing work. So pastels, as with charcoal, they're a dry medium. And you can see because I have higher quality ones, it's going on, you know, the vibrancy is very, very rich. And that's going to be the compromise when you go with the cheaper one. I think this might be a cheaper one. Uh, it's going to be a compromise in pigment saturation. So I don't know if you can see it with the camera, but one's sort of dull, one's very rich in color. Um, for some people, that's important. For other people, not so important. So charcoal, or sorry, pastel, soft pastel, more or less the same as charcoal in that you can sort of smudge it, you can reapply it, and you can move it around. You can use the blending stump. Um, you can sort of build it up. What you're going to find is with the cheaper ones, cheaper pastels, it's going to be hard to layer, right? If you have experience painting, you probably know that layering is a big part of, of, of making, um, you know, more sort of full images. Um, the cheaper ones are going to be hard to layer. The more expensive ones, it's going to be a bit easier to layer. So, for example, I'm going to run this sienna over top, right? It laid right on top quite nicely. Um, another thing that you can do in order to layer is you can put a workable fixative on this. Now, fixatives, um, the ones that we've been using for the past few decades, extremely toxic. Like, you know, you, not only can you not do it inside, but when it's outside, it's got to off gas for a few hours and it's just horrible. So we're going to try not to do that. Uh, and fortunately, over the past few years, there's been a few different products that have come out. Um, so this one, this one's, uh, uh, it's, um, what do they call it? Uh, it's not a, oh, it's a milk. Yeah. Um, so I know it's lactose. Uh, because Degas um, and a few of the artists around his time, they would use egg white uh, in sort of a spritzer and they probably put some water in it and that's how they would asphyxiate it before chemicals came came out and such. So now we're going back to the, uh, the lactose-based uh, fixatives. Um, this one I find to be a really great product. It um, It is workable, so you can spray it let it dry and work back into it. And you'll find that it sort of locks it in a little bit so you can develop your layers. Uh, it can also be used as a finished sort of fixative so that if you're worried about your piece smearing or anything like that, you can use that. Um, it's not as good as the chemical options, but it's only like maybe 10% lesser quality. So in my opinion, it's well worth investing in. So those are your pastels. Um, personally, I don't work with pastels too, too much, um, but they are a great medium um, and they're also great to sort of mix in with other materials that you potentially have just to get a splash of color. Um, or you could use Conte. Conte, the ones that I illustrate to you are brown, white, and black, uh, but they also make a full range of colors. So you could try Conte. Uh, Conte also, I might note, isn't as messy, so you don't have all the powder sort of falling down. Um, and again, a concern around the, the pigments being, being powder and getting airborne and such. Uh, with the Conte, because it is wax, everything is sticking together a lot more than it is with the Conte. All right, so that was the dry medium. Next, I want to share with you some wet medium. Um, and I know the wet sort of segues into a painting sensibility a little bit. Um, so I'm going to start with ink. Ink is one of my favorite materials. You can probably tell with my setup here. Uh, I use a ton, ton, ton of ink. Um, personally, when I work with ink, because I always say ink sort of has its own personality. 
I, I like to use things like skewers and chopsticks to get these very irregular lines. Um, but you might like a little bit more control and you can use a nib. Uh, you can use some of the more traditional applicants. Um, right, and this will give you a very consistent sort of line and you can get different size nibs where you can really control it. But do be warned, ink does not like to be controlled. It definitely has its own personality um, and it's more sort of a, you know, trying to understand its personality and working with it. Um, so that's ink. There's a few different, you know, you have drawing ink, you have India ink, you have um, these, these various uh, acrylic sort of inks. Everyone has a different preference. Um, I find with the acrylic inks, they go a bit more opaque. They're a little bit thicker. They're not as transparent and my washes don't work as good. Um, the nice thing is that you can get more saturated, more vibrant colors than what you're getting with the drawing inks and these different options. Um, so th those are the different ink products. I'm not too particular about them, but I know some ink drawers are like, you know, this is good, that's not good. But I just say, you know, feel it out and see which one works best for you. Um, you can also get, you know, Chinese calligraphy ink that comes in these big, huge bins. Uh, I use that quite a bit. I find those ones are very transparent. They're very diluted. Um, again, some artists like that, but I find just your general artist drawing ink that are intended for, um, for drawing are the best options. Uh, again, chopsticks, skewers, anything that's wood, you can grab a branch of a tree outside. Don't pull it off the tree, find it on the ground, I guess. Um, so when you're applying the ink, you can see this sort of puddled up on me a little bit. Now over here, I have an ink wash which is just water with a little bit of ink and you don't need that much ink to create an ink wash, right? So it's like that. And then as I get closer to the ink, once it gets the wet, it's gonna bleed right in. And that's something that I love when it happens. Um, and I actually, I try to create a circumstance where that is gonna happen. And then I can react to that and I can draw something into it or I can collage over top of it. Um, so that's, that's where I like it that ink has its own personality because it's going to do things that I can't control but I get to react to it and that's sort of that's a process that really is of interest to me um, so you can play around with ink that way um, the ink that I'm working with right now is a permanent ink permanent ink just means that once it dries it's it's locked in you're not going to be able to move it around um, non permanent inks are ones that even if it's a little bit dry once it gets wet it can it will it will be malleable again um, there's these brushes that have become quite popular uh, they're from japan i have no idea what their names are um, but these are non permanent brushes so they, um, once you put them down, even if they're a little bit dry, when you add water to them, they're still going to move around a little bit. And this one is a black one, but you can also get it in brown. I think you can get a few colors. So you can see, I mean, this paper, not to the same degree, uh, but I know when I work in my moleskin sketchbook, when I'm doing urban sketching, it's a lot more malleable. And this this is a Canson paper that I'm working with. So you can see it's it's a little bit easier to move around. And even that area that was completely dry, it's lifting a little bit, not to the same degree as in my moleskin sketchbook. Um, and it's interesting too. We we always assume all inks are the same color that black is black, but black isn't black. We can see that my drawing ink is quite a bit warmer. Whereas this one's quite a bit cooler. So that's one product um, that I like working with quite a bit because it is so malleable, uh, but some artists don't like it for that very reason. Uh, when I'm working with ink, I'll also um, like to work in tandem with these, with these different drawing, or sorry, drafting pens. Uh, and there's various companies that make them. And you'll see that on the tip, they have different numbers depending on the size of their tip here. 
So their tip, let's sort of see it. Um, there's different widths. The lower the number, the smaller the tip. So generally when I start my drawing off, I'm gonna start with the lowest number that I have. And it looks like it's a 0 0.05. So this one's a Strathmore. Um, really thin line so I can sort of go through if I'm doing a building I can sort of draft it out and then I can slowly as I'm more confident with the form increase the size and then when I want to add a whole lot of weight to the shape you know I can bring in a five I just went from a three to a five so a, a point five that one was a little bit dead uh, this one's a four um, in my urban sketching bag I have a whole range all the way up to an eight and a brush so I like to work with a nice range but you're able to get some good sharpness and again I sort of like playing around with these you know because I can draw into this right and sort of play around with this shape um, you know use my imagination and and find some some sort of form that I want to you know, pretend exists. That's not really anything, but you get the idea. So that's that's my ink. Um, comes in various forms, numerous applications. There's no real wrong way to do ink, uh, but what you can do wrong is not have a paper that's heavy enough to handle the water. Uh, so the one that I'm working with, again, it's a Canton mixed media sketchbook, um, but when I'm in the field where I'm doing urban sketching, landscape and such, I have a tendency to use moleskin. Moleskin makes some really good, um, I think they're called Water Plus or Watercolor Plus sketchbooks um, that are really nice. And of course they have those panoramic formats that everyone loves. So that's ink. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about watercolor. Now, the way that I use watercolor isn't in the same way that a watercolorist does because you have painters um, who are watercolorists sort of like oil painters and they don't mix it with anything there's sort of a right way and a wrong way to do it um, whereas me I think of watercolor just as colored ink right so if I'm working with the subject uh, so for example last year I went to Calgary's big fair summer fair called the Calgary Stampede um, and I drew sort of the carnival rides and stuff it wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense for me to do that in black and white because black and white you know it's a little bit of a somber situation so so i brought out my watercolor uh, and you can see i have this uh winsor and newton uh, mobile set so winsor and newton makes this great set the only thing that i don't like about it is it doesn't have a violet but you can get bigger ones smaller ones and of course if there's a color you don't like you can pop out one color and just squeeze in watercolor you know from a tube so i can take you know this thing of watercolor i can squeeze it in there and let it dry and essentially i have a, a mobile little puck of watercolor um so i use these and because i work in the field quite a bit i also like to have these pens which are loaded with water and you can you can get different size of tips and when you squeeze it the water sort of comes out you have to sort of get used to you know how much you're squeezing but you can see I can get that a little bit wet and throw down some color like such um, when I was working in the stampede um, at first I tried to be very controlled with my watercolor but sort of like ink you can't control it too much but I did want precision so what I did is I sort of just roughed and I generalized all the colors that I was that I was seeing in front of me. Um, I let that dry, and then I came full circle with my drafting pens because again, as with the ink wash, they complement each other quite nicely. This isn't quite quite dry yet, but I'll just give a little demo so you could, you know, um, you know, if there was some sort of a shape over top of that, I can just. I can draw over top of it, you know, and this sort of, it's okay if it transitions from there to there. So working with your drafting pens, with an ink wash, um, with the ink pen, with your watercolors, quite a few options 
with using the wet medium. Now with that, um, there's no reason why you can't combine wet and dry. And I'm going to show a few examples of me doing that, but you know, I can take my powdered charcoal and knock in a shadow, right? There's nothing saying I can't do that. And we can see when it touched the water, it's behaving quite differently. This is a little bit wet. And these are, to quote Bob Ross, uh, happy mistakes, right? So I'm getting a lot of, a lot of interest here. Uh, I got color, I got heavy, I got line, etc. And this is sort of the area that I like to operate in where there's no parameters of materials I can or cannot use. And just with this, you know, I can see limitless possibilities of working into it, either with my imagination or putting some sort of subject in front of that. You know, I'm, I'm seeing a car right away, right? Maybe it's a car, maybe it's whatever, or you can spin it around. Um, maybe it's a person, right, receiving a cup of coffee. Who knows? Uh, but I like to start off with sort of a, a preference for materials rather than representation. Because uh, representation, it's great because it speaks to something outside of itself. Uh, but we also have to acknowledge and understand that we're in a post-photography era. And as artists, you know, what are the areas that we're sort of exploring beyond just can I make the plant look like the plant? Which is a great place to be. Uh, but also, what else can we can we add to that? So that's my demo. Um, I hope you enjoy. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section. And um, within good time, I'll, I'll try to address them. Thank you.